The young leaders present at the Global Baku Forum represent the best and brightest of the next generation. While they can benefit from our extensive knowledge and experience, we can benefit from their fresh, innovative, and enlightening discussions on issues important to them. Together, we can help create an environment that will be secure and protective for them, a world where they can create and thrive. Welcome to the panel. Youth Speak. We listen. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a very special privilege uh, to open the last panel of Baku Forum. And I'll try to explain you why this is a special privilege. Every day, some child is born. Every day, somebody passes away. And that's a rule of nature. And we have to follow them, but we very often forget about that. And we think that we become older, be more experienced, be more smart, we have more wisdom. That's true. But uh, if you gain something, you always lose something. And what I lose is creativity. Our creativity of experienced people is limited by stereotypes, experiences, and experiences always are based on bad news. So the creativity is going down with years. We are too much concerned not to make mistakes. But this is a real example. The new generation can be creative. And they are creative. And in three days, they have learned a lot from all us experience, listened to us all experienced, and now they will provide the innovation, new thoughts, new ideas of their young generation. Not yet experienced so much as we are, but very, very creative. And I wish all the panelists all the best and all the success. And we will get a lot of inspiration strengths for future. Let's go on. In a world where we fear the different, resent the successful, hold unreconciled grievances about history, and may have conflicting visions of the future, providing opportunities for dialogue is essential. It is important for us, former, current leaders, but it is even more essential for future leaders. We We'll remember what we learned here, what we saw here for the next 10, 20, 30 years. But the young people will remember for many more decades. They will take the knowledge that they gained here in Baku, the skills they learned, and the things they saw with them a half century into the future. When NGIC brings young leaders here, the youth gain from our experience in leadership and we gain from the opportunity to listen to them. So use this opportunity to talk with them, to tell them of your dreams. They might become theirs. Listen to their dreams because they might become yours. I um, would like to tell you how we will run this panel. I think our Nobel Prize winner will come in and say a few remarks, depending on when he comes. It just uh, very good. Then we will have three panels. They will each give a short statement that they prepared themselves on a certain topic. And then after their, uh, each panel, we will have one or two questions from the audience and then quickly move in to our next panel. Um, so, should I start on the, rec uh, maybe I should start with the, um, by introducing the first panel. Our first panel will be on international peace and security. Please stand when I say your names because you don't have name tags. 
Vahid Aliyev is a young leader alumnus and he returned this year to help organize the forum and to moderate this panel. Vahid received his law degree from University College London. He served in numerous positions in the government of Azerbaijan, has worked with numerous think tanks as a researcher. He's written a book about Karabakh and published many articles about international humanitarian law, AI, and modern warfare. <laughs> Lesya Ohresko from Ukraine is a strong proponent of public administration reform. She worked with, in various UN agencies on human rights and development matters and in the Ukraine's cabinet of ministers. She is currently concentrating on civil society oversight of the reconstruction of Ukraine and also leads security matters at a prominent Ukrainian think tank. <laughs> Natalia, I've seen you so often, I'm not sure if I'm gonna pronounce your last name correctly and I apologize if I don't. Natalia Knipse is studying for her master's at University of Latvia and is the previous youth delegate to the United Nations. Her work centers around defending human rights and she is passionate about strategic litigation, litigation rule of law, and human dignity. <laughs> Talibor Islam is a researcher, columnist, writer, and advocate for youth empowerment human rights, and SDGs. He's written so much I can't even start uh, uh, listing it. He founded several organizations including Hello and Hello, a language and soft skills institute. He has received an amazing number of prestigious awards in the UK. <laughs> Martin Steins was a member of the Latvian parliament from 2019 to 22 and is now a teacher um, and is also on the Education, Culture, and Sports Committee on the Riga City Council. He is involved in promoting youth politics and civil society. Okay. Emilia Bayramova is an Azerbaijani young leader who is the chairperson of the youth organization ASAN Volunteers and works for the State Agency for Public Service and Social Innovations with the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Marina Domushkina from Ukraine focuses on protection of civilians in conflict and complex emergencies. With an MA in International Peace and Conflict Studies, she has served at the OSCE and UN, including UNICEF, UNHCR, and Save the Children, and now works with the Black Sea Grain Initiative with the UN. She has spent a great deal of time in conflict areas of Donbass documenting human rights violations. think why don't we start our panel and then why don't we start now because uh, somebody we were supposed to have an inter a small speech now but let's start with um, <coughs> good afternoon uh, I hope you can hear me I'm audible uh, we approached uh, to our favorite part uh, of the forum which is this panel and without, without further delay I would like to turn to Lesia and uh, to hear her, uh, let's say, Ukrainian perspective. We, we spoke a lot about peace and war, peace agreements, uh, but I would love to hear uh, the Ukrainian perspective on how peace uh, should look like in the eyes of the Ukrainians. Thank Please, you, Lesia. Vahid, and thank you, first and foremost, um, to the organizers for the opportunity to speak and uh, for this amazing hospitality. I would indeed like to reflect on many things that I have heard during the last couple of days of this forum, but also a topic that is very much dominating, or at least very prominently present in the international media landscape, and that is the call for an immediate ceasefire, an immediate peace in Ukraine. And I can, as a Ukrainian, totally understand this. The world is frustrated and the world is tired. As the war, the full-scale invasion of Russia on Ukraine has indeed had a detrimental effect on global economy, on food security, on energy supplies, on global inflation, and so many other detrimental effects. And uh, as a Ukrainian, 
I understand that. The world is tired, but so is Ukraine. And if we're talking about peace, believe me, there is no other country that longs and craves for peace more than Ukraine. But it is therefore particularly saddening for Ukrainian to hear so many calls on for an immediate peace, an immediate ceasefire, because we Ukrainians have apparently naively thought that the devastating evidence of Bucha, the devastating evidence of Irpin, of Mariupol, of Izum, and I can go on for quite a while, that all of this collective evidence will demonstrate and showcase the world what life for Ukrainians would mean and actually means under Russian occupation. And when you, ladies and gentlemen, are talking about immediate peace and immediate ceasefire, you have to understand that we in Ukraine see immediate Bucha and immediate Mariupol. Let me explain that just for a second. Let us unpack the term, which is now really very often used, that of peace and immediate ceasefire. What this usually entails is this, the freezing of the status quo. And what freezing of the status quo essentially means is that the territories, and most importantly the people of Ukraine that are currently under Russian occupation, stay under Russian occupation. And that means a continuation for these people of mass murder, of mass torture, of mass rape, and all the other human rights violations that are happening throughout this year and actually throughout the last nine years in the east of Ukraine. And I want you to remember that every time you are talking and calling on, especially Ukrainians, to uh, deliver a ceasefire in the form of Ukrainians seizing their resistance and seizing their fight for independence and for our national identity. And I completely agree, and I think the world community needs to talk about peace. But, why, uh, but what I understand under peace in Ukraine is that of first the Ukrainian victory that is then, of course, followed by negotiations, by peace talks, by ceasefire, and all of these issues. Because when we are talking about, um, when we are talking about the next security architecture of Europe, the next security architecture of the transatlantic space and even beyond, we need to understand that this very much depends on how the Russian aggression of Ukraine will end and how we will see the resolution of this war unfolding in front of our eyes. Because essentially this is very much linked to the next world order. And when we are talking about and thinking about the next world order, essentially this all comes down to a very simple question. What world do we want to live in tomorrow? And um, the underlying principle is, do we want to live in a world where the aggressor, the perpetrator, the country that is committing multiple international crimes and violating all possible standards and rules of the international world order is brought to justice and is punished, or a world where this essentially doesn't happen? And I think an honest answer to this question will lead us to the understanding what next world order we are embarking on and what the resolution of the Russian-Ukraine war will look like. Thank you. Um, we also spoke a lot about arms control and uh, I would like to address this topic to Natalia, to our panelists from Latvia. Please, Natalia. Thank you, Vahid, and thank you to all the organizers for this impeccable event. It is an honor to be here today addressing all of you. And I would like to begin with a story. When I was a little girl, I spent many summer days in our family dacha by the river. 
the Soviets had built hydroelectric stations on this river, thus not only drowning landmarks important to the Latvian people, but also with each changing tide, revealing the relics, the battles fought along these riverbanks and on the appropriately named Island of Death had been left behind. So my little sister and I would spend our days walking along, along the river, finding pieces of shrapnel, uh, pieces of medicine bottles from battles long before, but most often we found bullets. And some of these bullets were intact, but most had clear indications of the target that they had hit, clear indica indications representing the lives they had taken and the futures they had robbed. And thus, as Lesia incredibly pointed out, Russia's monstrous attack on Ukraine has highlighted for many the intergenerational scars imperialist aggression has left on the societies that happen to be in the path of their glorified efforts of world domination. The treaties that are supposed to make the world feel safer are not only struggling, but they are failing completely and going extinct. With a bully like Russia and the consequences of its gruesome acts, we need to keep taking preventative steps to ensure accountability and strengthen the guardrails keeping our world order intact and in order to build a better one. And these guardrails thus far have been based on trust. Arms control at its core is about predictability and balance. Our current arms control regime, or, or lack thereof, was shaped during the Cold War with two nuclear armed superpowers dictating the global order. But with more and more states uh, reaching nuclear capacity and, and developing it, this binary approach is no longer viable and the system that has led us to the situation we're in now is incapable of solving it and in creating a, a future without another Cuban Missile Crisis. And so, Putin's suspension of the New START Treaty, which was the last remaining active treaty be between the United States and Russia, is a clear sign of intent. Russia has already rattled its nuclear saber multiple times since the start of the war, and it shows that this is the type of leveraging that we're going to have to be faced going forward. Democracy, rule of law, and accountability are not just principles. They are values of a multilateral global world. And anyone who disagrees with them, who disagrees with the territorial integrity of a sovereign state, must not be allowed to decide on how we continue building our world going forward. And my memories of picking up bullets are by no means unique. Those bullets have been there since World War I. Where I come from, if you did not experience the war, you heard about the war. You saw it in relics within your own home. The intergenerational impact of the brutality of aggression is undeniable, and therefore international law and arms control must not be selfish and must not be short-sighted. We must listen to and turn to those currently feeling the wrath of madmen in power firsthand, not only for guidance, but also for advice on who to trust, if to trust, and when and if to compromise. Slava Ukraini, thank you. Uh, we would like to continue with the topic of uh, arms control and to hear uh, South Asian perspective on arms control, on the situation, uh, on the war of, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And Talibur, please. Uh, thank you, Wahid. Uh, thank you, uh, the, uh, thank you to the organizer for arranging this. And I believe I'm the only representative of Bangladesh here. So, uh, and first of all, I would like to thanks to this audience who came here like just after the lunch. So thank you so much. I really appreciate that y the way you are appreciating us. Thank you so much. So I came from a country where we have already 170 million population in a. Uh, country where it is only 1047 1, square kilometer and recently in 2017 uh, we sheltered 3 million Rohingya refugee in our country although we have already a land constraint in our country and also resources but uh, in 2017 
Myanmar government at that time and the army had a genocide and ethnic cleansing uh, in Myanmar and that's, that's, that's came as a result that three, three million people were di displaced from that country. And personally, we as a Bangladeshi, we fought for our country and we achieve our independence by uh, getting into the war in 1971. So we know the pain, we know the consequences of, of, a, of involving in a war and we don't want it anymore. But since we, are, we were supported at that time when we were in danger, so we, we, we shelter, we gave the shelter to the uh, Rohingya refugee population, and, but we don't have space in our country. So uh, how this it happened? Myanmar, I'm just giving it as a case study so that uh, our STEAM audience can understand it better. So Myanmar is also considered as a least developing country. So how a least developing country can't afford that much of weapons in their country? So because it's because we don't have, we have treaties on paper. We don't have the implementation on the ground. That's why both rich or poor uh, or least development country, all are get taking the advantage of armed business. And let me tell you about the armed business as well. Uh, currently, the world has almost trillion dollar bus uh, arm business per year. It's a trillion dollar. And USA alone is contributing to the 79% uh, in this market. And European Union 10%, Russia 5%, China 2%. But these are the official records. Unofficial records could be much, be much more. And these are the exporting, so not the weapons that are used for the domestic or internal purposes. So that's why it is very important that whatever we have on paper, not as a promises. So in the United Nations treaties, it is said as a promises. But as we are here, we all know that uh, in politics, promises are meant to be broken. So we have to make sure that we follow those uh, treaties uh, strictly so that we don't have, we don't see devastation that we had uh, in 2017 in Myanmar, right now we are uh, seeing the same in Ukraine. And, and on the other hand, because of the Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis and sanctions, there are countries like Global South who are facing the consequences of it economically. So we are not, we, we are not rich country we have, who have lots of resources and re, uh, foreign reserve in our bank account. So we have to rely on the uh, rely on our daily goods uh, exporting from other countries and the raw materials for our export. Uh, that's how our economy works. But because of the Ukraine and Russia crisis, these things, uh, the economic condition has been changed. The global, market, uh, the global market has been unstable. As a result, the prices of our necessary daily goods uh, that we need uh, every day has been increased. And many, uh, a, a large number of people, like in terms of population, uh, million population, they uh, convert into more poverty and also having more hunger. So this is a problem, I, I believe, not only the global uh, uh, Bangladesh, but also the global south. So that's why it is very important uh, to address this issue, as my uh, fellow presenters said, that we need to ha stop this war at first and uh, start our conversation through diplomacy. I know that uh, diplomacy might take time, but it is better to lose lives. It is better to not to lose lives, but to uh, have some uh, uh, diplomacy, even it takes long time. Because I believe lives matter more than the patients, because we have already lots of patients here in this room. So, and about the treaties, uh, I, I will urge our uh, audience and also the, our global leaders to come up for the uh, arms treaties and so that uh, we can arrange disarmament for reducing the impact of, uh, of armed trade. So, thank you.
um, as our panel call is called uh, International Peace and Security. Uh, when we talk about peace, uh, we always overlook the role of the NGOs and volunteers in peace processes. And uh, I would like to address the question of um, in relation to NGOs and their role in peace processes to our panelists from Latvia. Uh, Martins, please, could you tell us uh, why do you think, in your opinion, they should be included in peace processes, uh, the role of uh, Latvian NGOs in particular uh, in the war, uh, in, in humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine, um, and your personal experience as well. Thanks. Dear panel moderator, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Zatlers, Madam Yushchenko, Excellencies, uh, fellow uh, forum participants and young leaders, uh, there are so many reasons to be worried about the state of the world today. Russia is continuing its war of death and destruction in Euro Ukraine. This unjustified attack against a peaceful neighbor has given rise to worldwide inflation, which in turn has driven hundreds of millions of people into poverty. Russia's authoritarian regime is forging closer alliances with other autocratic nations like Iran, China, and North Korea. In addition uh, to all of this political and economic instability, the COVID-19 pandemic has not ended. And, uh, and the negative effects to climate change on our main environment show uh, no sign of abating. What can we do to address all of these alarming issues. I would like to highlight the positive and underwhelmed role that non-governmental non organizations or NGO can play to foster international peace and security. Thousands of NGOs all across the world are staffed by dedicated volunteers who selflessly devote their time and financial, financial resources to make this world a better place. Too many of these NGOs remain chronically underfunded and unappreciated. For understandable reasons, uh, many countries are investing considerable resources into military defense and energy self-sufficiency. These are indeed important priorities. However, we should not neglect the need to invest additional resources in NGOs and people who run them. Investments in people who devote their lives uh, to help their peers are investments into our collective security and well-being. So many NGOs are conducting so much important work for the good of our societies. They work fearlessly to help sick and the needy, to educate our children and youth, to, promo to promote healthy and democratic civil societies. Government cannot ensure world peace, security, and pr prosperity in their own. In many cases, NGOs uh, can respond to crisis situations more quickly and more effectively than governmental agencies. As, uh, as the former president of Latvia, Mrs. Vairavid Freiberg, has said, we Latvians will stand together with the people of Ukraine for as long as it takes. I have no doubt to, uh, than, uh, that together with other energetic people and NGOs from all over the world, we will help the people of Ukraine to successfully rebuild their war-torn country so that it can flourish as a vibrant and prosperous European democracy. In Latvia, NGOs have engaged in uh, fruitful partnerships with government agencies to resolve all kinds of pressing issues, such as supporting patients during the COVID crisis and providing assistance to Ukrainian refugees. In the, first, uh, in the very first hour that uh, followed Russia's invasion in Ukraine in 2022, Latvian NGOs joined force by creating communication networks in WhatsApp and social media platforms, despite the fact then Latvia is one of the smallest countries in Lat Air Europe with less than uh, 2 million inhabitants. Latvian NGOs have provided tens of millions of euros as assistance to Ukraine and Ukrainian 
refugees in Latvia. It is very important for NGOs to receive a steady stream of public funding that they can rely upon to maintain their operations. That is why I urge the political leaders of Latvia and other countries, as well as international organization, organizations, to provide the financial support that NGOs require to conduct their important work. Both emotional support and financial support is import are important. In closing, I would also uh, like to mention an international initiative uh, that was uh, launched in uh, Latvia in uh, two, uh, 2009. It is World NGO Day, which people all across the world mark every year on February 27th. This is a wonderful opportunity to honor the contribution that NGOs, volunteers make every day in, the, in uh, every day to international peace and security, sometimes even at uh, the cost of their lives. I therefore encourage every country to make World NGO Day an official day of commemoration on its national calendar. The NGOs in Latvia, in Ukraine, and all across the world truly deserve our wholehearted gratitude and support. Thank you. Uh, we continue with the topic of the participants in peace processes, and I would like to move the focus from Ukraine to uh, the situation on the uh, Lachin Hankandi road of the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan. And I would like Emilia to talk about the role of volunteers in peace process worldwide, maybe some case studies across the globe. Uh, what are the main obstacles that volunteers face uh, in terms of implementing their activities? And uh, as I said, the situation on that road, which was also the agenda of the international media recently. Thank you. Thank you, Wahid. First and foremost, it's my utmost honor and pleasure to be a keynote speaker at this important panel discussion with the Intense Global Baku Forum. I thank uh, Nizami Ganjavi International Center for the invitation and uh, for empowering the youth in their activities. So my activity has uh, related uh, to volunteers for six years. That's why this panel uh, for important to me. And I want to talk about the role of volunteerism in promoting peace and solidarity. So uh, volunteers play a crucial role in promoting peace and solidarity within communities and society as a whole. Uh, volunteering brings people from different backgrounds, cultures, and ages together and allows them to work towards a common goal. Through effective communication and discussion, volunteers can build awareness about peace and solidarity and work on peaceful resolution of conflicts. So young volunteers uh, should recognize the role of uh, and power of uh, their volunteers' efforts and use them to strengthen peace and stability in their communities. Today, we consider them as the future leaders of our society who will encourage dialogue and collaboration within and between communities or nations towards peaceful solutions. Let me also touch upon how volunteers can actually get involved in peace processes. Uh, the young volunteers uh, can be invited to take part in informal peace processes, initiatives, activities, and projects. Because of the inherent volunteer spirit, they are more willing and passionate about communicating with members of different nations, ethnic groups, communities, or minority groups. Uh, volunteers can help understand their problems, concerns, and opinions and take actions to build bridges uh, between these groups and uh, spite of the difference. The involvement of youth in peace projects can be demonstrated with various case studies from, from UN volunteers. For instance, um, the volunteers in Timor Leste are involved in a monitoring project for the conflict related risk, are evaluated, and warning systems are developed. In Sri Lanka, young volunteers play an active role. 
uh, in uh, dealing with and developing effective solutions to reduce the level of violent extremism among the members of society. According to a peace project in Kenya, the participation of youth in initiative created more trust in the members of different communities and convince them more effectively uh, that uh, coexistence and a mutual uh, trust and possible to build and sustain in the country. Volunteers have a community spirit, a sense of responsibility, a culture of help and contribution creative thinking, initiative outlook, and creative ideas which help to resolve conflicts and initiative peace. So, uh, in, uh, in the mind while uh, volunteerism is one of the core values that hold a crucial uh, place in the national value system of Azerbaijan with deep historical and cultural roots. Uh, since ancient times, the Azerbaijani people have always carried on the tradition of helping those in need. In this regard, the youth of uh, Azerbaijan have also embraced uh, these deeply rooted traditions. The modern wave of volunteerism in Azerbaijan has been uh, developed based uh, on those historical traditions. The youth policy which was founded by national leader Haider Aliyev and is being successfully continued today by President Ilham Aliyev ensures the active participation of Azerbaijani youth in all spheres of society. Volunteers also play an important role uh, in transforming our country into a strong state and contributing to improving uh, people's uh, welfare in all spheres of life. The modern wave of volunteerism gained momentum in Azerbaijan under Assan service. As of 2012, young people started to take an active role in uh, provision of public services and social innovations in Azerbaijan under the umbrella, the Youth Assam Volunteers Organization. Volunteerism activities which first started in Baku city soon began to be organized in Assan service centers throughout the country. These trends soon began to be applied in the activities of other public and private entities, NGOs. The declaration of the year 2020 by President Ilham Aliyev as year of volunteers also paved the way for the future expansion of volunteer activities in Azerbaijan. To conclude, I believe the power of volunteerism and dedicated volunteers can successfully transform communities and societies by bringing peace, stability, and social cohesion. Uh, we need to unite uh, our power and resources to address the challenges volunteers face globally. Sometimes we see that the role of volunteers is undervalued and underappreciated. This not only damages their spirits, but also hinders uh, the further expansion of their activities. Financial support for the activities of volunteers is also a matter of concern that should be addressed with the help of stakeholders. Campaigners must uh, consider supporting volunteers within the corporate social responsibility activities, and this is indeed an important issue for cons consideration. This being said, I strongly urge all young volunteers to start getting interested in these issues of peace and conflict, engage in peace projects and contribute to peace building efforts in their community, country or different parts of the world. I also call upon uh, public bodies, private entities and NGOs to support volunteerism within their activities, uh, considering their huge uh, potential to spark a positive change all around the globe. Uh, by the way, uh, I want to talk uh, about uh, our volunteers uh, on the Lachen Hankandi Road. Uh, 
the peaceful protests of Azerbaijan ecologists and young volunteers on the Lachan Khan Candy Road over the illegal exploitation uh, of mineral deposits, especially the Gazilbulag and Demirli ones, located in the Azerbaijani territories, where the Russian peacekeeping contingent is temporarily deployed, has been going on for the 90 day back to back. I'd also like to use this opportunity to shed light on an issue uh, which I think is intriguing for our international friends. Uh, despite the widespread propaganda on the alleged uh, blockade, our volunteers freely assembled to prevent illegal activities and ecological exploitation in the Azerbaijani territories. Uh, and our protesters ensure through movement of the uh, vehicles used for humanitarian purpose. Thank you. Uh, and I now turn to Marina, also from Ukraine, and uh, I would like you to share your thoughts uh, on the current situation, current war um, between Russia and Ukraine and touch upon uh, when do you think it started? It started as a national or international conflict already. How you see, how can you address uh, the questions of access to justice, impunity, uh, how you see uh, restoration of justice and all other topics, please, within this yeah, domain. Thank you so much, Vahid. Thank you so much, organizers, for inviting. It is a privilege and honor uh, to speak today and to talk about Ukraine. Um, for the past th three days, I heard many times from this same podium about ceasefire, an immediate ceasefire, and how it is important to preserve human life. I guess this is very fair, but also surprises me, because probably for many of you in this room, the war started in Ukraine on 24th of February 2022, when in reality, it actually started in 2014. Ukraine been in war for nine years. It's just because of Russian propaganda, they were called separatist war and internal conflict, when in reality it was international conflict and people were dying for nine years. I would also like to say that the war is won on the battlefield and the peace is achieved in the room, but there is no way to achieve sustainable peace until Ukraine will win the war. Ukraine already had ceasefire it was in 2014 and 15 with Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 agreements. It never held it. We trusted, we went and got the agreement with the enemy. We got this fire, people continued dying. In 2016, I was in occupied Donetsk for the first time. I spent there almost four years back and forth. And I was referred by a woman in Donetsk city, she needed a humanitarian assistance, and she comes to me, introduces herself, and the first question, she asks me, where are you from? And I'm from Poltava, but I live and work in Kyiv. Kyiv was perceived as an enemy. The Russian propaganda got so deep and broad that Kyiv regime was named as an enemy. And she immediately asks me the follow-up question, do you also consider us enemies and separatists? And for me, it was very deeply touching question because I said, you are not separatists for me, you are not enemies. You are my people, despite of the fact that you are, that you are now living in the territory that are temporarily not under control of the Ukrainian government. She started crying and hugging. And she said that it was the first time in two years that she heard herself not being called as a separatist only because she stayed and lived in Donetsk. For me, it was the start of understanding that the propaganda of Russian Federation about the notion of separatism got so deep and broadly affecting not only back the time occupied Donetsk, but also Ukraine and abroad. We were called at the country that is not in war, but the country that has internal conflict and has a separatist movement. There is no separatists, and there won't be a separatist if not for the support of Russian Federation-backed forces. And this is, should be, and should continue to be repeated, that Ukraine was united before 2014. But the question and reality is that we also called those people separatists. 
and the propaganda affected us as well. How we can get those people back? What we should do? And the answer is simple. It's justice and accountability. This year, uh, European Court for Human Rights uh, achieved unprecedented decision, actually determined that Russian Federation got an effective control of those areas, thus responsible for grave human rights violations. And we should start talking about special tribunals on the war of aggression and crimes of aggression, not only to, starting from 24th of February, but actually from 2014, until people of Ukraine, both in government control and in Ukraine, and temporarily, and I would like to say temporarily, occupied territories get the justice and those who are perpetrators will be held accountable, there will be no sustainable peace. But in order to achieve it, Ukraine needs to get full control of its territories. Apart from that, the communication should start from the government and from international communities as well. The communication that Ukraine is actually still believes that this is our territory and we will get it back, despite of others call for immediate ceasefire or for immediate peace. I would like to say that the all decisions that are taken right now in Ukraine is ultimately responsible, um, responsibility of Ukrainian government and Ukrainian citizens. And it is our way how and when we will get to the room of negotiations for signing any agreement. But again, there is no sustainable peace without justice and accountability. And um, for that, we rely a lot on international community for support and guidance, for the legal advice, how to achieve it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just uh, quick concluding remarks. I would like to turn to Lesia. Uh, as an international community, what should we understand about the war in Ukraine? Uh, uh, could you please just um, give us some quick important points and solutions as well. Thank you. Um, sure. I, I think one of the central problems when we are addressing the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the resolution uh, of this war is the lack of a unified vision of the West of how a Ukrainian victory which leads them basically to a victory of the whole world and a victory of justice and accountability, as Marina just rightly mentioned, can look like. And it is exactly this lack of vision that holds us back in our, uh, in our joint action. Now, this question is obviously a very, very difficult one. Um, many of you might have um, your own opinion of how this, uh, this resolution could look like. I can only share with you a couple of uh, ingredients of the recipe that we in Ukraine are very often discussing. It has a couple of points. One of the first and most important points is uh, military support and the military victory of Ukraine. Uh, we have seen so far very often the so-called salami-sliced policies when providing Ukraine weapons and the, all the necessary means that we need to kick out the aggressor. And we believe this spoon-feeding exercise, when this ally gives, gives us two tanks, and this ally gives us three tanks, and all this bargaining has to stop. And when we're talking about a Ukrainian military victory, we need all of the support at once. And it's steadfast, um, fast, uh, speed fast delivery. The second one has to do with the security architecture that has to be built on the principle of exclusivity and not inclusivity. I think the world, especially the Western world, has been deceived for many decades when thinking about the ridiculous term of a common security space from Vladivo from uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok or from Lisbon to Vladivostok because security is based on trust and if countries do not share their sa the same values and the same principles how can you build a trusted security a, a common security space 
third in my list is the principle that the aggressor has to be brought to justice. And I cannot agree more with what has just uh, said my, my common delegate Marina. It's about the very important role of the International Criminal Court, but it's also something that the, the ICC cannot tackle at the time being, and that is the creation of a special tribunal for the crime of aggression, so that the Putin regime and his proxies are being held accountable and, uh, and justice survives. The fourth element has to do with the work and the proper functioning of international organizations, especially the United Nations. The organizations have to have legal remedies to punish their members that are violating international rules and standards. And as a former UN employee, I cannot just feel sorry and, and regret for the pitiful and shameful situation that the UN is finding itself in, especially the Security Council, where a permanent member that has a specific role in upholding international security and international justice is breaking all possible rules and standards of the world order. And one more thing about the United Nations. Do you know that Russia is the only member state that did not undergo a legal procedure when entering, um, re-entering basically the United Nations in 1991 after the dissolution of the Soviet Union? And this is one problem that we are currently, we as Ukraine, together wi with certain allies are addressing in the General Assembly and general across the UN system. Um, my next point, I will be just very brief, Madame Yushchenko, for sure, um, is about the principle that the aggress aggressor must pay. Of course, we understand that the reconstruction of Ukraine will be a matter, first and foremost, for Ukraine and for Ukraine's budget. Of course, we are also very much reliant and expecting certain international support in this particular sphere. But I think that it would be only just if the aggressor pays for most of the destruction, for the physical destruction that can be paid off. Um, that's why it is absolutely paramount that the 300 billion frozen assets, 300 billion US dollars of frozen Russian assets that are now in European countries can be legally confiscated. That's why it is a very important to-do point for our Western allies to find the legal mechanisms in order to legally confiscate these frozen assets that are now in these countries. And uh, last but not least, that is the question of, again, security, which is very much tied to the topics that we have just discussed in the previous panel about nuclear, uh, nuclear uh, non-proliferation. As you know, Ukraine in the early 90s had to give up or voluntarily gave up the world's third biggest nuclear arsenal in exchange for security guarantees and insurances. I think, ladies and gentlemen, we all see and know what what we have now out of these security guarantees to Ukraine. That's why a NATO membership of, the, of Ukraine after the end of this war has to be very much on the top of our political and foreign political agenda. Thank you very much and Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Thank you, Vahid, for, for organizing such a thought-provoking and excellent panel. Um, as I mentioned, we will be having three such panels on various issues, and, but it also we will now, in a, in a minute, have a very special guest make a re some remarks before the next panel. But before we do that, I would like to ask if there are one or two important questions in the audience. I think David. Thank you. I would like to begin by commending highly the uh, anonymous young leaders, thank you, Katerina, for <laughs> presenting them, um, for very, very mature, well thought through, 
and uh, compelling statements, and as you mentioned, that they had prepared themselves, mm -hmm. um, which is only to be expected. At the same time, I'd like to commend uh, uh, NGIC for uh, having these voices here. Uh, but conversely, I think that um, a lot more effect would have been uh, obtained had these young leaders, A, had a name on their respective uh, screens and been part of all the other panels and not had a separate panel. This goes to the heart of the need to mainstream the views of the young generation and not to have them separately in, a, uh, in the last panel of, of a three-day conference. Uh, just as a throwaway remark, I'm not sure I understand uh, at what stage, uh, w what age will they reach in order to obtain a name for their <laughs> screen? <laughs> And um, since I'm sounding pretty critical, I should, uh, I think, direct criticism towards my own quarter, which is the UN. Uh, for the 30 years that I've been in the UN, I have heard and uh, I have edited speeches that uh, refer to the need to bring in uh, young uh, views and young people and young colleagues into the UN system and into the Secretariat, uh, namely. And yet, for all this time, there has not been a uh, docking mechanism that would allow young people to come in. If anything, the member states of the organization that run everything, including, and first and foremost, the Fifth Committee, uh, which has to do with administration and finance, they are going out of their way in order to uh, to, to create a situation where mm, the young people can only uh, come in at a more advanced stage in their life. Just as an example, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm making a big speech here, um, Kofi Annan began his career as a P1, professional level one, in the World Health uh, Organization. P1 as a post, as a position, no longer exists. An office can create a P1 position which only takes about a year and a half or two years of experience, can create if the office has some extra budgetary funds. But there is no such position in the regular budget. Why? Because the regular budget is being cut, cut, cut. And as I mentioned, I think the member states are passing that off as, a, as reform. It's nothing of the sort. It is cutting the budget of one principal organ of the organization. So, if I could ask all the um, outstanding leaders here, past and present, to uh, engender in their countries a movement, to, uh, a movement in the government to send instructions to their representatives in the Fifth Committee uh, to uh, try to reverse this situation and create this docking mechanism for young people. Thank you very much. Sorry for the long time. No, thank you. We agree entirely, and very often when things like this happen, where there's no names, it's very often just a small bureaucratic error. And we try every year to make the group more prominent, more diverse, uh, yeah, show more diversity in our group, regional and so on. Sometimes it works a little bit better, sometimes a little bit less, depending on what applications we received. and and I apologize, on the name tags, is the third year in a row I've been asking for them, <laughs> so. <laughs> we actually have okay. a very quick response as okay. well. Yes, I would like to thank you for, for pointing that out, and yes, my name is Natalia, for those who can't remember or can't see. But uh, the initial way that young people often enter the UN is through internships, and these internships remain unpaid, and it goes to show what type of people can afford to live in cities like Geneva and New York and work at the UN without any pay. And those are the people who have the opportunity to enter the system uh, at a younger age. Hello. Uh, 
Uh, Natalia, thank you very much for that. Uh, I'd just like to clarify something. Uh, internships are not paid. Uh, the internships do not exist only in Geneva and New York. You can get an internship anywhere there is a UN office. You don't have to travel. Internships uh, in any country or in any UN office are there for young people who are studying and they need to do an internship somewhere uh, to take up their summer months. And uh, you have a choice uh, between flipping burgers and uh, taking an internship. Now, there was a stunt, uh, a stunt pulled off by, a, a, uh, by an intern who was very well off, um, who spent a night in the park in order to make this point. Now, uh, you have to know uh, that most of the interns, a very large percentage, I would say, are incredibly happy to do the internship because they get three or six months of being in everything except salary and badge, being a UN staff member, having a UN email address, having uh, the ability to connect, make uh, f uh, connections for the future, etc. So uh, there is a vast uh, opinion that is against getting rid of the uh, internships. We cannot pay the internships because the moment we go to the fifth committee and the ACABQ, some of you may know this term, the, um, uh, it's a committee that deals with the budget before the fifth committee, the moment we ask for a budget line to pay for internships, the internships will be shut down. Mm -hmm. So, but I will say that the UN did not do itself or its image any um, uh, favors by bureaucratically reorganizing things and putting internships on the website under the rubric UN jobs. When I saw that, I was aghast because we were asking for trouble. So Thank I just you. wanted to explain this so that other students don't go down this false road. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So um, I would like to ask everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. There is a question. Just the last one. One question. Well, yes. just sir, I am a former UN officer, 25 years in the UN. What also needs to be said, there is inequality in accessing also those positions because you have what we call the junior program officer program that is funded by a country who can fund those programs. And those countries are Western countries. There is no G, uh, GPO for any African countries because we can afford it. So when you enter as a GPO in the UN, what happened, you stay on. So this is also another inequality within the system. So I can talk on and on because I also spent 25 years in it. So even between the South and the North, there is right there an inequality within the UN in accessing position as young people. But that wasn't even my point. I just reacted to it because I also advocated for a fund that would uh, really bring national in, no matter where they come from. It's still not the case. So this is also something that the UN need to address for equality purposes. But my question to young people is, we happen to be young people too. <laughs> so how do you see yourself doing things differently at the international level? Do you feel like you have more ability and capacity or an environment that is more conducive to fight injustice, to fight racism, and to bring more equality into international relationship? What is it that you have maybe that your elders don't have. Can you sort of, you know, discuss on that? Oh, who please. would like to address the question? Just with one sentence, please. No, Marina, I please. I can do one. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, first of all, to David, uh, some of us already retired from the UN as P3, <laughs> starting from the internships, and asking and answering the question, uh, I think what is the most differ us from the previous generation is us who are now in our early 30s and those who are in the middle 20s right now, we have the voice. We have the space to raise our voice and even if we are not granted that space, we create it for our own. That's what you see. And that's why there is 
uh, climate change activist. That's why you remember Fridays for Climate. It's because it's youth who activated and self-organized themselves. And this is the small steps that we do and we hope future generations after us will have even more. So there is always a start point and it started now. And uh, the, the point that we have a space to raise the voice and many of us believe that the change starts from, with us and from us. That we don't need to wait for someone to take the decision. And um, what I believe, tend to believe and also feel from my generation that we have this concept that with rights there are also responsibilities. That is why in the last five, ten years there were movements that were fighting climate change, that were fighting uh, um, racism, that were fighting inequalities. We've started talking about women, peace and security 23 uh, years ago and later after 13 resolutions we are still trying to get women on the first row of negotiation table when we already need to start talking about more inclusive not only women but also people of color and LGBTQI. So we are definitely way, way to go but at least we were given the space and we are trying to change it. Thank you. And if I may add very quickly, in order to build further in solidarity, you need to have empathy. In order to have empathy, you need to know the stories of the people you are working with and the people that you feel you are an ally of. We are very aware that we are not a representation of the whole world here on the stage today and in the coming two panels. However, we have the advantage of being able to communicate with young people from all across the world, of having friends all ac across the world hearing their stories, hearing their lived experiences, and with those, moving forward into building an inclusive future. We do not think that we are better than the generations before us, but we do have many of the tools that make it easier to move forward and build better. Thank you. Please, just give me one second. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so uh, we are hearing from the perspective from the Western country, so I would like to just add quickly from the perspective of South Asian country. So as a young generation, we are more constructive. So we are not much conventional like our old leaders are, or like previous leaders are. I would not say old, so old is a biased word. So I would say that I would, uh, I see uh, youthness in every uh, politician or every head of uh, states. But uh, I believe, we believe in a uh, multiculturalism. So that's the key to work and we, uh, we, uh, we criticize people in, to, in, or, in order to make things better. So, and we make sure that our peers are taking everything constructively and we are taking the same uh, the way. So that's what I want to add. Thank you. Well, I think you agree that the young people we have here, this panel, and that you will see in the, few, in the second two panels are truly remarkable. Let's please give them a hand of applause. <laughs> and now I would like to invite Dr. Ismail Sergeldin. It's for the third panel. Yeah. The second will be at the table. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to ask a man who is a man of passion and compassion, a caring, inspiring person who cares about the young and did more for saving youth from the hardship of child labor and from the difficulties of oppression and destitution. I ask you to join me in welcoming Nobel Peace Laureate Kailash Satyati.
My dear young friends, sisters and brothers, listening to these youth leaders was a challenge because each of their sentences were challenging our conscience, our individual and collective conscience. It was challenging our policies. It was challenging our promises and our honesty. And therefore, I strongly believe that no voice could be more compelling stronger, louder, and honest than the voice of young people. I salute you, my dear friends. <laughs> this session with young people and listening to them is like the cherry on the cake. All the Experienced, wise, learned people have been cooking some cake in the last three days, and these youth have put the cherry on it. Isn't it? <laughs> I've been working with young people for all my life, believing the inherent power, the power of truth in them. I'll give you a couple of examples because the new session, the next uh, uh, panel will begin soon. When I realized that hundreds of millions of children in the world are trapped into slavery, sold and bought in lesser prices than the animals, like animals, raped, brutalized, Their present, their future, their childhood, their innocence, their education, their health is ruined, robbed off. I understood that the change is not possible without the leadership of young people. Many of you will surprise to learn that until 1999, there was no international law against slavery of children or children who were engaged in hazardous occupations. Then I had a crazy idea that let us march across the globe, march with the young people, students, youth. I still recall that from January to nine, January 1998 to June, six months, we walked across 103 countries from three corners of the world simultaneously. 15 million young people, mostly young people, and of course, some of their parents and teachers also joined. And when a group of youth was invited to address the General Assembly of International Labor Organization, what they call the ILO Convention, a young boy came on the stage and he challenged a Nepali boy that world is not so poor that cannot take away the tools and guns from our tiny hands and replace them with books and toys. A young girl from Sudan, she was on the dais and challenged the world that only a week long global military expenditure, annual expenditure, can ensure education and freedom of every child. I tell you, dear friends, no government could say no to it. Many of the world leaders were in tears because that was a very straight, very direct challenge from the young people who were suffering. And they they were chanting 
slogans, no more tools in tiny hands, we want books, we want toys. Within a week, a resolution has been passed that we need such an international law to combat the worst forms of child labor and slavery. And within a year, in the following session of 99, ILO has unanimously passed a convention. And that is now the only universally ratified convention in the history of United Nations. That was the power of young people. That time, the number of child laborers was 250 million. And then it has decreased to 150 million, to be precise, 152 million by 2016. But dear friends, now when we together have been successful to incorporate the issues of children in sustainable development goals, and the UN Secretary General perhaps as the reward or as the recognition of my humble effort, invited me to join his small group, what they call the UN SDG advocates, 17 advocates, and I'm one of them. So we celebrated that we are going to change. But between 2016 and 2020, the number of child laborers has grown for the first time in two decades, before pandemic from 152 million to 160 million. There is no excuse, there is no justification. But the power of youth continues. Young friends in Germany, they assemble together under a bigger umbrella of what I call 100 million for 100 million. 100 million young people should become the spokesperson for 100 million children and young people who are suffering from different kind of crimes, wars, conflicts, atrocities, and violence, including slavery. 100 million. So the German young people stood together and called their minister four, five years, four years ago, five years ago. Great Muller and challenge him that in Germany we cannot use, we cannot employ, in fact, child laborers in our companies, German companies. But same German companies can go to Africa, for Asia, Latin America, Middle East. They can engage child slaves, child laborers. This is unacceptable. That challenge was so sharp and strong that within three years, the German government, the German parliament has passed a law to check the supply chain of those companies which were using child labor or forced labor in foreign countries. Similarly, when Norwegian government, again, four or five years ago before pandemic has decided to cut their ODA for education. The students and the student unions from Norway and Sweden, particularly Sweden, the Swedish youth gave a call to their politicians and parliamentarians to visit their schools. 20% of the parliament members, including many of the ministers, visited their schools where they studied when they were children and the students raised a voice, asked a direct question. Are we poor? The Sweden is getting so poor that we are going to reduce the funding for education in African countries. They had no answer. A special hearing was organized in Swedish parliament where these youth representatives spoke face to face, spoke truth to power. And within the same day in the evening, I got a call. I was also present there. The CEDA has given a the CEDA's uh, director general called me and said that we are reversing our decision and we are going to increase 
our support for education in developing countries by 80 percent. That was the power of young people. I gave these examples when the youth come together. Not only on abstract issues, not as the preachers, not as someone who is talking the same thing, but just devise some action. Some years ago, there was a very st strong, very, very, uh, I would say, uh, critical uh, situation. There was a serious border tension between India and Pakistan. And I started getting calls from some of the young people from Pakistan, where I've been working for many years, and from India. They said, we have to do something. We cannot allow it to happen. There should not be war between these two nuclear, nuclear countries. And those who were leading this campaign were some of those young children who participated in an activity which I organized 20 years ago, before this. That was cricket for peace. Nothing much, but a group of Indian young people visited Pakistan for two, three weeks, and they played cricket. Vice versa, the Pakistani youth were brought to India. That was more than 25 years ago now. They were brought to India, and they played cricket with many of the groups. And it has gone so deep that they decided to continue as friends, the social media, as one of the young ladies just said that now there are so many technical ways to work together. And they have become the champions and the spokesperson in concrete terms not just saying that there should not be a war, but when they came together, they spent about a month together, both in India and Pakistan. They have become the strong champion for peace between these two countries. So the voices of young people are not only stronger and louder voices, honest voices, but they are the voices of unity. When they come together and stay time, stay together, they can create a culture of unity. It has happened. Yesterday, I had a very, very good meeting with the, very engaging meeting with the, uh, with the president. And uh, he carefully discussed on several issues, including one very important issue which I wanted to share with you, and he fully agreed and put his support. I requested or suggested him that it's a great experience that these youth are coming here and we are listening to them and they have been listening for ages, so this is the time we have to listen to your young people. Can we think of organizing a special summit or conclave of young people where the youth who are survivors from different violence, conflict, wars, insurgencies from different countries, 50 countries maybe. It could be Ukrainian young people and Armenian young people, young people from Myanmar and the Rohingya, young people from Eritrea and Ethiopia and South Sudan, young people from India and Pakistan, they should come and spend some time together. They should discuss among the issues, just informal, in informal and formal setups. They should talk together. They should learn how to talk and listen to each other. And that space which could be created for young people can bring a different kind of relationship and friendship between those people and they will understand each other, which perhaps we people in our age cannot understand because of the complacency of our political mindset or ideological mindset. These young people can bring about miracles. And uh, he agrees for that and uh, hopefully NGIC 
and uh, my organization, the Satyarthi Movement for Global Compassion, uh, will be working together on bringing the young people, the survivor leaders from all across the world here in Baku sometime towards the end of this year and next year to listen to those young people finally. They should talk among themselves and come out with a strong moral challenge again that we don't want this, we want compassion, we want peace, we want humanity and that is going to happen soon hopefully the young people should sit, should sit on the driving seat and I think we should give space to them. We should give uh, more time to them and I'm sure that this world would be much better in the hands of young people. I can say three things, one thing in one, three things in one sentence to young people that I not only discovered, I'm not a theoretical person, in 40, 45 years of my life, I physically, with the help of my friends, rescued 115,000 young people from slavery in India alone and millions of young people from across the globe. I work in 140 countries. So I know the power of young people. So on the basis of that, what I did I learn was 3D, 3D. My first D is dream. Every young people must dream. If you are allowed to dream, why you dream small? Have big dreams, bigger dreams, biggest dreams. Why you wanted to become only the volunteers and wanted to uh, dream for the volunteers of United Nations? One day you should become the Secretary General of United Nations and change the present situation of United Nations which is pleading or preaching had no teeth, no power, unfortunately. That has to be changed. More inclusive, more dynamic, a stronger UN we all should make together. And young people, one of you should be the Secretary General and we should come and clap. Dream big. But those who dream for themselves, they can become rich, powerful, but they are not changing the world for better. Dream for others. My second dream is discover. Discover the power within. Use power you are born with. And the power outside, opportunities outside. Connect is the biggest opportunity and biggest strength. So connect with each other through social media and other ways. Discover power. And third is when you have dreams, when you have discovered yourself, whom are you waiting for? Don't feel, don't wait for a leader to come and change the future of humankind. You are the change. You are the change, my dear young friends. You are the leaders. You are the champions. Do it now. My third is do. So dream, discover, and do. This is something which I have learned so I can share with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, that was incredibly inspiring. I would like the, the second panel on environment and technology to please come to the stage. Please come quickly as possible. And please, um, if possible, limit your remarks to up to three minutes as had we had agreed before. Okay. Is everybody here? Okay. Now please sit and then as I um, announce, please stand up so we know who is who. The, uh, I would first like to, um, to announce Asen Plevnelia from Bulgaria. He <laughs> is an alumnus of last year's forum and he's returned to help this year with his panel um, on environment and technology. He has currently studied economics and politics at the University of Manchester with a special interest in energy policy and artificial intelligence. 
Marko Babic is from Croatia and he has a master's degree from Zagreb University where he specialized in the history of dissidents in socialist Yugoslavia and the Yugoslav Wars and published his first book, The Forgotten Dissidents. <laughs> he now works in the Croatian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Department for the Three Seas Initiative. Shante Harris from the US is a young leader who is deeply committed to advancing innovation in finance to meet the needs of climate innovators. She was named by Forbes as a 30 under 30 in energy and has won many other incredibly impressive awards. She has spent her career scaling campaigns, technologies, and ideas for the White House, Fortune 5,000 5, companies, and startups in energy transition. Imam Fakim is from Mauritius, but is currently a product designer in the UK. She received her master's um, from University of Reading where she studied perceptions of sustainability through packaging design and marketing, and is a fervent advocate for sustainability in the design industry. <laughs> Shahrukh Khan is a lawyer from the United States. He formerly taught history, government, and literature as a high school teacher in New York City. Did you start? Andreas Neff is development manager at the St. Gallen Symposium in Switzerland. He initiated the first Global Leadership Challenge with Oxford University and St. Gallen is deeply committed to intergenerational dialogue and collaboration. Ascend, please. Hello, everybody, your excellencies. It is a great honor, and on behalf of all of our speakers, I'd like to thank Nizami Gonjavi for the opportunity to speak at this incredible panel. As President Zatler said initially, we young leaders are here mostly for two reasons. One of them is to learn from your experiences, and the other one is to share our thoughts and ideas. And as young leaders, following up on that, we would like to innovate and find new solutions to things already existing. And we start with the structure of this panel. Rather than the existing structure of people listening and uh, saying their opening statements, and then later having room for questions, we would like to propose a new structure where we're going to have a discussion. I'm going to ask questions to each of the panelists, and they will have a little bit of time to respond, maybe intervene if they'd like, and then eventually we'll try being quick so that there's room for questions at the end. I'd like to begin with Marco. Marco, you have talked to me a lot about a global gap currently in the ability for countries to secure sustainable and reliable uh, connectivity links between them. <coughs> I would like to hear your thoughts on how international platforms can be used to help close this gap. Right. <coughs> Thank you, Asen. Well, I would like to bring your attention to two connectivity uh, platforms. As Madam Yushchenko also mentioned, I have experience working with one, which is the Three Cs Initiative. Um, because I think that uh, the 3Cs initiative, which was launched in 2016 by Croatia and Poland, and also I would like to thank one of the uh, co-founders of the initiative. Thank you, uh, President uh, Premnelia, for our conversation yesterday. It was a very brief one, but it was very informative. And thank you for your leadership in the initiative. And thank you, Asen, for introducing us. <laughs> of course. Anyway. Um, the other initiative is a more recent one, which was initiated in 2021 by the European Commission called the Global Gateway. Uh, both of these initiatives focus on similar three pillars, which are energy, digital, and uh, transport. But the Global Gateway also deals with uh, health and education. Um, I think these two initiatives, they were, although there is a, because they were timely uh, initiated, having in mind the global challenges that we are facing, such as the global you know, supply chain crisis, the food crisis, the energy crisis, I think they serve as a template of how Europe can forge stronger ties with other parts of the world, at least in terms of infrastructure. And I think the strategic geography of three seas initiative countries, meaning Croatia, the country that I'm coming from, and other 11 uh, Central European EU member states, um, allows these, this region to, uh, to, uh, to assume the pivotal role in the global gateway and become the gateway linking Europe with other parts of the world, as this region is bordering the Western Balkans, the Eastern Partnership, and yeah, I would, I would stop it here. Perfect, thank you, Marco. Aside from that, aside from the role of international platforms, what can countries individually, and specifically small countries do, 
and also what is the role of geography in uh, the possibility of closing this gap? Well, I'll use Croatia as an example. Yes. Uh, if you know some of geography of Europe, you would know that we are located on the coast of the Adriatic, which, just to give you some perspective, is almost three times smaller than the Caspian Sea, for instance. However, its potential is vast but untapped. So I think that um, our ports, Croatian ports on the Adriatic, are 2,000 nautical miles closer to the near and far east than some other more renowned European ports such as Rotterdam or Hamburg. And it allows the small, geographically, at least a uh, country like Croatia to become the entry point to one of the fastest growing regions in the world, which is the Three Seas region or um, Central Europe. Uh, so, but also in terms of energy, it allows us to become the entry point of the north-south gas corridor that we're trying to establish and modernize uh, between Croatia and Poland and thereby allow Central Europe, which up until recently uh, has been heavily reliant on a single source of energy. So I think that our energy terminal of Kirk allows Central Europe to get gas from virtually any part of the world. But there are also many other connectivity uh, projects that we have to work hard on. Since we're in Azerbaijan, I would just like to mention Ionian Adriatic Pipeline, which would allow Central Europe and the Western Balkans to receive gas from the Southern Gas Corridor and thereby uh, you know, have another uh, supply route of gas. So, yeah. Perfect, thanks a lot, Marco, that was very informative. I hope the speakers have gotten a new idea of something that can be explored. Yeah, as I was option. trying to be really quick to. Yes, you know. I think you're doing a good <laughs> job so far. Let's keep it that way. So, uh, if we move on, uh, but we stay on the topic of international cooperation and the global mindset, I'd like to turn to Shante. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some emerging themes and opportunities that are on a global scale in relation to investments in energy, which countries can explore cooperatively? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, just to throw out or start with a statistic um, for those who might be following what venture capital looks like right now, which is essentially early stage investments into technologies. A quarter of all climate, or excuse me, of all venture capital investments in the past year actually went to climate technology. So uh, that means over $70 billion were invested in climate solutions. Um, that was more than half of what we saw in 2021. And the reason why this matters is because it shows that not only is there a tension, and we've heard this time and time again throughout the forum, um, on global climate solutions, but also the need for investment in them. Um, I spent the past two years running a climate tech venture studio, which essentially just means I was investing um, around $10 million into early stage climate tech solutions. I wanna note that those solutions came from everywhere in the globe. So we put a global call out for ideas. We got over 700 submissions spanning 64 countries. And I feel the need to say that at a forum like this, uh, particularly because it shows that uh, while you know ingenuity and intelligence is really all across the globe, what is not is access to capital. And what we need is, if we're gonna talk about a global crisis like the climate crisis, is access to the best talent, right? And the best people who, who can solve this problem. And so that means that our investment structures have to be diversified. They have to be diversified in the way that they look for solutions, but also who they give solutions to. Um, one of our founders was actually from UK Ukraine originally. And you know, what we saw in the midst of him building uh, a company called Dynamic Air Cooling was not only his ingenuity to keep building a company in the midst of all of the geopolitical things that have been mentioned today, but really his true commitment to creating a better world. And I think what we see through climate tech investment is really an opportunity to merge some of the, the hardest and most challenging and pressing problems across the globe with investment and ingenuity that comes from young people. Um, I want to mention another founder that uh, I was able to fund in my, in my previous role. Uh, her name's Shelly Zhu. She's from Hong Kong originally, and I'm particularly excited about her solution because it's a circular solution, which essentially just means she's taking textiles. So we have billions of textile waste across the globe. Um, they lead to things like, you know, child labor that was discussed in previous panels. And what she's doing is actually paying climate refugees four times the minimum wage in Bangladesh to create a climate refugee jacket, which is coming from waste from denim. 
and so both of these you know, solutions, but also the founders behind them, because when we talk about tech, I think we oftentimes tend to take the humanity out of it. All of our technological and science innovations are founded by people. They're founded by people who have you know, the courage, but also the ingenuity to come up with these solutions. Um, and then another solution that I want to name is a founder uh, from the US. She's built a technology and actually uh, worked on an IP that uh, when we think about you know, the, the future of the water crisis, we are going to have to ramp up desalination plants across the globe. Um, I was reading earlier that Azerbaijan actually is bringing one of its first desalination plants to this area. And while you know, that is an incredible technology and solution that's needed in order for us to preserve humanity. With that comes waste, and so she's built a solution that takes the, the brine waste, and when you turn seawater to fresh water, right, there's brine waste that comes from it. And what she's able to do is essentially turn that brine waste into new minerals that can be sold back to industry. So when we're talking about investment and the opportunity for investment, it really means that there's a chance to invest across things like circular economy, material science, buildings, mobility, so all of the things that we interact with every single day, right? The way that we move through cities or regions, the way that we build current buildings and future buildings. And I, I wanna express that while there's all this conversation around technology, the reality is that all of this technology actually has to be implemented through projects. So we heard that during lunch, right? We were talking about whether it was nuclear fusion or the opportunity to invest in larger scale projects. Um, the, the thing that I've been particularly passionate about is while commercial facilities are great, while you know global pipelines are required for things like transmission, what we can't lose sight of is that the climate crisis is happening now, which means when we look at resiliency, what we also need to be thinking about are distributed projects. And when I say distributed projects, I mean really the opportunity to not just invest in $200 million huge commercial facilities that are in one area, but really distributed projects that create local and resilient economies across the globe. And so that's been my focus area, but I also want to express how important it is that it's everyone's focus area in this room, because it will lead not only to more resilient economies, but when we talk about natural disasters, the ability to, to meet um, some of the energy security conversations that we've seen over and over throughout this forum. Um, so I'm really excited by what is a trillion dollar industry. I'm excited about it because it, it, it means that we can do business in a different way, but also there's an ability to impact lives every day through jobs, through workforce development, through upward economic mobility, which to me is really at the heart of a lot of the conversations we're having during this forum. When we talk about peace and security, we're talking about people having the right to upward economic mobility and ability to really just use their innate gifts, right, to create innovative solutions. Thank you, Shante. Shante, your, your answer is very informative, and I have one more question actually prepared for you, but due to time concerns, I will save it for a bit later, and Madam Yushchenko, if we have the time, you will let me know a bit later, but thank you for the answer. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to move a little bit more towards the private sector. The private sector has obviously done incredible efforts and things, results for battling climate change. However, there has been a lot of criticism lately about companies greenwashing the products and lying in a way about the, the quality and the environmental, uh, environmental impact they would have. So Iman, I would like to ask you, could you tell us a little bit more about greenwashing, including about what are the negative effects that this false marketing brings, and as well whether there are some ways to, to combat this issue? Great. Thank you very much for this question. Um, so first and foremost, I'd like to bring up some context and really reiterate what was said in the earlier panels today, especially for the African panel, that the world is going through various forms of disruptions, especially when it comes down to climate change. Um, those disruptions can be seen on the natural, social, and economic forms and systems, and various entities such as corporations, countries, communities, are all going to be affected by it. And Everyone, every form of organizations are trying to mitigate its impact, but I think we also need to very much look at the individuals and the fact that um, consumerism, well, consumerists, sorry, are trying to change it by changing their own lifestyle choices and becoming conscious consumers and trying to invest more in eco-friendly brand. Um, and having those political and social pressures, companies are trying to adapt and change their own ways by taking different forms of media, so for example, different forms of marketing strategies to um, become more sustainable and appeal at this new customer base. But um, 
as already mentioned, for greenwashing, one of the main problems that lies within this is when those different marketing strategies are changed and can be quite misleading and appear greener than what they, are actu they actually are, which is basically greenwashing. And the consequences of greenwashing is basically that for consumers, they become much more skeptical of green claims because it leads to various forms of confusion and for them to be quite critical afterwards when making environmental claims. But also for companies, it leads to, for example, having a loss of reputation, a loss of brand value and so on and so forth. And consumers are demanding much more and more transparency. So there are various forms of solutions that can be brought afterwards forward to mitigate um, the fact of pro potentially being accused of greenwashing. So for example, is to have a collaboration between the public and the private sector. So for example, abiding to various forms of certificates. Um, so one of the, for example, the ones that I can think of on top of my head will be B Corp, Rainforest Alliances, the EU Eco Label, so on and so forth. Um, there's another form of solution is that we have more and more discussions and really draw the line when it's just marketing strategies to just appear green or when it's purposefully misleading, which leads me to afterwards another form of solutions that we can push forward is the fact that um, within those panels, for example, for the Global Baku Forum, is to really bring in forward more of a public and a private sector to have more honest and truthful conversations about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, apart from the international aspect and the private aspect, another thing that we need to address is our mindset in tackling climate change. This question I'm going to ask was actually very much inspired by Zwatko. I see him over there in the back of the room. Uh, and essentially, Zwatko yesterday said how people view investments in healthcare and education as a cost, but rather we should view them as investment in our population. Similarly, when it comes to climate change, we often view investment in that as charitable work and contributing towards a certain cause. Instead, if we change our mindset and think of those investments as actual investments, that would incentivize people and companies and organization and international institutions to take much more action on this issue. So this is incredibly important in my opinion. So, Sharuk, I would like to ask you, what can we do in order to make this mindset change happen? Uh, yeah, thanks, Asen. So I kind of want to uh, uh, piggyback off of what Shante was saying earlier about right. taking humans out of the solutions. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the one takeaway that maybe I can leave you with is consider the thought, um, don't preserve nature. Um, don't preserve the environment. And the point there being, um, I'll give you three examples. The first really starts about 120 years ago uh, with US President Teddy Roosevelt. His tenure was between 1901 and 1909. He established five national parks. Now that scheme has grown to about 230 million acres. Not a single one of those acres is livable land. You cannot buy that land and build a house on it. But that kind of erases, now, now you say that's a good thing, we should enjoy that nature. But that kind of masks the 500 plus broken treaties with various Native American tribes. They were pushed out of that land so that that land could be preserved. Another example, the African savannas. You had tens of thousands of years of migration of various Bantu tribes. They can't, they can't migrate anymore. And that's because we as tourists can pay a couple of thousand dollars, go in there and on the safaris watch the giraffes. Uh, consider Badakhshan in uh, the Tajik-Afghan border um, where the Karakoram range meets the Western Himalayas. Similar issue, the native people there who have been living there for thousands of years uh, are being told you can't allow your livestock to grow past a certain number because then endangered species are uh, fighting for this, uh, common resources. Um, but that's how they've lived for thousands of years. Um, and so that's all part of our effort to preserve nature. And we do that by kind of literally dehumanizing the lands where that preservation occurs. And so that requires a change in the language and the mindset that we have about economic, uh, excuse me, environmental conservation. Um, uh, thanks, so that's kind of where I wanna leave it. Thank you.
Thank you so much, and thank you for coming back to what Shante said earlier. It, it kind of shows how this is supposed to be a conversation building off of each other's points and also mentioning your own thing. It should be a combination between the two, so thank you for that. Then uh, this panel is called Environment and Technology, so we need to go to the technology aspect. Uh, Andreas, you are the person for that, so I would like to ask you. Andreas, you've told me before that you are very interested in the topic of legal tech. Could you tell us what exactly that implies and also why is it important to see changes in that domain right now specifically? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just for your understanding, legal tech is the use of technology and software to provide, for example, legal solutions and to improve the efficiency of legal processes. So it's different than um, tech law, which means technology law, what is like regulating the technology in like every sector. So why we need a change, why we need legal tech. So first I have to say legal tech should not change anything about the actual procedure law. This is very important, this must be respected and perceived at all cost in my opinion. But we have to be aware that very many people right now are still denied to access justice. And there, so law is very expensive right now. It's very complex, of course. It needs a lot of um, knowledge. It needs a lot of experience. And therefore, it's not accessible at low cost. So in my opinion, it's no longer feasible for legal professionals in a private sector and as well in the public sector to rely on outdated working methods. And there, and that's where legal tech comes in. It allows legal professionals to work much faster in a smarter way, more efficiently, cutting out their working time on easy tasks and take the time to do the work um, that really matters. And therefore the price um, to access legal information, for example, uh, can be significantly um, reduced. Through that, it's more accessible and affordable as well for people who may not have the needed access um, today. Thank you. Uh, you've talked about the positives with accessibility and affordability as well. Are there any negatives that we should consider as well? Yes, I have um, three main points. Um, one of that we already heard um, this morning at the first session, the first thing is data protection. I think I don't have to talk about much about that as we have a common understanding that cybersecurity is very important in that case. So we don't have to talk about it. We just have to get it done. Secondly, um, I always discuss this with my friends um, as well in Switzerland. The, um, the potential job loss, of course, when we have such a fast um, changing, fast development, um, there is a risk of um, job loss, but I think there as well, we already have um, the experience, for example, 20 to 25 years ago already with the dot com, so we just have to consider that. And thirdly, one of the most important points for me, we as well heard it um, this afternoon in the lunch session, is like um, the ethics and transparency when it comes to using artificial intelligence um, in the legal sector. Therefore, we have to really understand the decisions which an AI solution makes. And as well, we, need, um, we really need to make sure that we don't have unintended biases in the technology. So we need to regulate right now. We need to find the right balance between regulation and innovation, of course. And we just have to understand that AI is here right now. And therefore, we need trust and confidence and use AI for good. Thank you. Asen, I actually have a follow-up question to Andreas. Go ahead. Um, so I recall one of the things that I learned uh, when I was taking a class on data privacy, we were studying the um, GDPR, the General Data Regula Privacy Regulation, right, for, for Europe, um, the statute that regulates privacy. Um, the professor kind of started off the conversation with the question, do we have a right to be forgotten? As in, when you look up someone's name on Google, 
can the servers in various uh, search engines just delete that information if you request it? Like, I just don't want to be found on Google. And it, I, I don't know, it's, it sounds like an interesting proposition, but I mean, what do you think? Like, is that, is that something that is possible given like current innovation and data privacy? Like the idea that we can just reach out and ask companies to like erase our information? Or will they, they won't do that? I would say we should take that into consideration. Um, so when it comes to my personal opinion, I would say yes and no at the same time. Um, because when it comes to like uh, data protection, I always say if I say something in the public, may someone will hear it and tell it to his friend as well. But of course, for example, all those big companies who are collecting data, um, uh, they do it like professionally, uh, professionally and use it as well as a business in a business context and then the case is much, much more different. Can I add to that really quickly? Of course, go ahead. Um, I just want to say that it's already happening, right? There are people who are already asking and paying for the removal of their data from the web. Um, I think it's a question of, well, who has the right, the access, and the money to do that, and that opens up a larger question of equity. I think the other layer I want to add is that AI is itself a tool just in technology, just in the same way that technology is a tool, and I think under a lot of these conversations is the question of how, do, how are we using that tool and what is the intention behind that tool? And I mention AI again because the founder that I discussed earlier that's you know, paying climate refugees four times the minimum wage in Bangladesh is also using AI, but she's using AI to accelerate a process for uh, upcycling textile waste, right? And so I think uh, most things can be used either to advance progress and humanity or to bring us back, right? And I think a lot of what we need to be asking is how are we uh, understanding new technologies and new tools coming online and how are we processing that and thus what, it, what is the intention behind their use? And I feel like that should be a consistent iterative process of testing, trying, learning, doing it again so that we can have regulations that are responding at the rate that, quite frankly, science and technology is moving. It's moving so fast, I think it's really hard for most governments to actually keep up right with what's going on. And so, um, yeah, I, I would just offer that perspective of the intentionality behind all of it, the questions of how do we use it um, is really important here because it's not going to slow down. And so what can we do, um, whether that's investment in human capital, relational capital, intellectual capital, to ensure that those processes actually put humanity first? Shante, I completely agree with you, and especially when you mentioned the topic about regulation failing to keep up, I'd say this is a fundamental question whether it is possible actually for political institutions and for regulatory bodies to adapt at the pace at which technology, especially when we think about AI, is evolving. That is quite a fundamental question, and I think every single person who is in power in, or has been in positions of power or has contact with people in positions of power should think about the role of technology and how we can transform institutions to be as up to date as possible with it because it brings incredible opportunities. Uh, Madam Yushchenko, yes, <laughs> we have six minutes left. May I ask whether there is a final intervention or would you proceed to the question actually? I would like to proceed to your question. Right, go ahead. Yes, there are no questions. Perfect, sounds good. On the topic of environment and technology, are there any questions to our young panelists? Well then, I think <laughs> it's time for an intervention. Yes, it looks like we've covered quite a bit. So, uh, well, does anybody have any intervention or I otherwise have a question for Shante I had prepared for earlier, another one. <laughs> okay, Shante, uh, you have talked about at one point about the importance of innovation and investment. So I'd like to ask, what is the role of blended capital and other financial instruments in order to exploit the incredible opportunities that you mentioned as a response to my first question? How can such financial instruments be used in order to help tackle climate change? Yeah. 
Yeah, I love this question. I think at the heart of a lot of the challenges that humanity is facing is the question of whether our systems are actually equipped to meet them. Um, and one of the questions that I've been asking is, well, how can we actually structure financial investment in different ways to help meet those demands? Um, and so when we talk about blended finance, really what we're saying is can you combine private investment with public investment and also capital from philanthropic entities to move the needle on whether it's projects or technologies or just solutions in general that wouldn't otherwise exist. I think we're seeing this throughout Europe with the conversation around you know, natural capital. How can we actually start to quantify and thus purchase nature-based solutions in a way that sustains the health of the planet and people long term? Um, the, one of the biggest challenges that I see currently is historically we've had philanthropic dollars go to causes, go to NGOs, and um, I recall from the earlier Africa conversation or, or, or panel with African leaders that um, there was a call out to not just invest in NGOs, right, but to really invest in the economy. And so uh, what we have at this moment is an ability to take some of that money and really look at it as a catalyst for private investment. So how can you use things like first loss models? How can you create loan guarantees? How can you uh, implement tax credits at a time where you know, we're not going to be successful in solving the climate crisis or um, distributing these very valuable and important technologies that are actually leading industries to decarbonization if we don't think about financing them globally and financing them in a sustainable way. And so a lot of the work that I'm looking at now is um, how do we take some of that money that's coming online and use it to fund, again, not just the solutions and the technologies, but their implementation. And I think it's important to say that a lot of times solutions will be bought, right? So in the, the case study that I mentioned earlier of the woman building a textile waste startup, people will buy the jacket, but they, they may not actually buy the process of creating the jacket. And that, that question of, well, who pays for the implementation of a higher quality product that also leads to better outcomes for society, I think is really at the heart of the transactions that we're trying to complete that can solve uh, a lot of the, the challenges around the climate crisis. And so uh, many of the discussions I'm having now is how do we actually use philanthropic dollars or donations for things like offtake agreements if we're talking about you know, hydrogen at, at a mass scale uh, throughout various countries? Or what does it look like to um, catalyze investment from initial uh, technologies into the infrastructure? So one of the conversations that I've had with a few folks here is the fact that regardless of where you are in the world, there's a question of how do you accelerate government processes like permits, licenses, um, all of the pieces that are needed to actually implement projects. And that is a role, I think, quite frankly, that philanthropic capital can really help solve. It can help catalyze, you know, again, ex the acceleration of paperwork for all of the things that are necessary while also creating jobs. Um, so I think it's just a really exciting time for us to think about what does it look like to use uh, philanthropic dollars, donations, alongside private investment to support different types of solutions because many companies are not only building the solution and the technology in-house, they're also uh, creating things like workforce development programs, which we haven't historically seen through business models. And so what does it look like to sustain them long-term with the right types of capital? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. We have only room for closing remarks. I would just like to say, I did give a bit more breathing room to Shante, but every single one of these panelists is an expert in the topic they talked about, and they can say much more. It's just that they were pressured for time concerns, so we have time for the last panel as well. So if any of you is interested in the topics they talked about, they'll be more than happy to have a chat with you afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Well, and Asen, thank you very much for leading that so expertly. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And our next panel will be on education. Taking the further seat. Anywhere you guys would like. Wherever you would like.
Thank you so much to everybody for sticking with us throughout this time. I know we don't have much time left, so unfortunately the panelists will have to be uh, regulated to 30 seconds apiece. No, I'm just kidding. They're going to get three minutes apiece. But I appreciate all of you staying here after all this time. To those of you who are tired, I can uh, assure you that we'll finish as quickly as possible. To those of you who are already asleep, I hope this will wake you up. Uh, just as a quick introduction to our panelists, over here we have Hil Yoon, the founder of the Afghan Youth Ambassadors for Peace Organization. Next, we have Kai, so we're going out of order, Kai Chong, founder of Stick'em, a robotic startup focusing on youth interactions with technology and the development of soft skills. We have Kinsu Kumar, a former child laborer and the winner of the Billion Acts of Award for his work on child labor and rights. He, and uh, we have Marcus Zabello, who is currently studying international law, business, and is primarily interested in equal education and accessibility uh, for children. We have Raphael Hajabaili, the executive director of the Azerbaijani Students and Alumni Platform and vice chairman of the National Assembly of Youth Organizations of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Very long acronym. Uh, finally, uh, next, we have Rudolf Kruminc, a public relations student in Riga, Latvia, who is passionate about personal development and social issues, issues related to education and mental health. We have Lalita, the elected president of the National Children's Assembly of India and the recipient, the recipient of the Reebok Fit to Fight Award and the Ashoka Young Changemaker Award. Now, without further ado, it's my honor to give the floor to Hila to begin our panel today, talking about the role of international communities in transforming and ameliorating education, specifically in zones of conflict. Thank you very much. Um. Thank you everyone for, for staying and I hope everyone is awake. Um, before I start, I want to mention, I don't have any statement, formal statement or a speech because for the last three days we heard enough UN jargon and speeches for 30 minutes without really understanding what they're talking about and actually addressing the real problem on the ground. Um, I want all of you who are present in this room to imagine two scenarios, just to inform you it's gonna be graphic, but I need to mention it. Imagine your daughter, sister, waking up in the morning, getting ready for school, but then when she enters the school gate, there's a man with the gun telling her that you're not allowed to go to school, you're not allowed to continue your education, because why? You're a woman, you're a woman. Imagine you have a son, and he wakes up in the morning to go to school, but the next day their parents return, uh, get their dead body because of the bomb blast that happens in school. This is the reality of Afghanistan on the ground right now. We don't have many platforms to share this, but it's important that you hear the reality of the ground. I want to mention something else. Today is the day that counts the 537 days since the Taliban banned school on girls in Afghanistan. I want all of you to Think about this and let it sink in. 537 day, it's not normal. When I was in university in 2017, um, I was studying my bachelor, and at 8 p.m., one terrorist group came to our university with a car full of bombs. We were stuck in the campus till 4 a.m., and 11 of our classmates died. We were hearing the scream, we saw the blood, and at the end, we still continued our education. We still went back to the same university and continued our education despite these problems we have in Afghanistan. <laughs> but when I became a refugee in UK and I was telling these stories of daily lives of Afghanistan um, children, girls and boys and the experience that I've been through, for me it was so normalized because I come from a conflict zone and then I met women and girls from Palestine, from Yemen, from Haiti, from DRC, went to the same experience. And we were having conversation and then we have other side of the country, which is well developed. And we are like, they were like, no, this is not normal, the way you're talking about your trauma. I'm like, yeah, I know, but this is how we brought up to. And then I went through a lot of progress in, in my mental well-being. And then I thought, why is it so normal for people coming from countries like us to talk about these issue without showing any emotion? because this situation has been normalized by the political leaders who are also present in this conference. This situation has been normalized by the UN. 
This situation is normalized by INGOs and their double standards that they have when they have collective approaches to war and gender equality and humanitarian supports in certain countries. Throughout this three days conference, that's why I don't have a speech, because I want to just reflect and react of what I've learned and what I've saw throughout this conference and other international platform as well. When we talk about the issues of Afghanistan, Yemen, and Ukraine, and, and other countries, like I've mentioned pre yesterday as well, we're not here to compare strategies. You suffer more, I've suffered less. We've all suffered, but some suffered more for decades of war. The context is different. They have been living through the same situation for years, for decades. It's because we have frustration and nobody is hearing us. That's why we're so frustrated when we talk about these things. When I talk to a lot of people, they're saying, oh, now you have peace in Afghanistan. But peace for us is not just the absence of war. Just because we're not seeing terrorist attacks every day, just because the bombs are not coming on a rooftop every day, doesn't mean we have peace in Afghanistan. Real peace for us means access to education. Real peace for us means women having freedom of movement in Afghanistan, women having the quality education, the right that they deserve. And that's the real peace we want in our country. Now, we, this panel name is Young People, we speak and you listen. But we just don't want you to listen. We want you to be heard. We want to be heard. We've been giving speeches days and days. And now when we ask for spaces, yet half of the conference is empty. <laughs> and just because of the time limit, but I want to address this, two things. Exactly. So in our first panel, a lot of young people, young people talked about how UN is treating young people without paying their job. And one of the representatives talked about that UN is doing this, but people in their own country need movements. But what about country where we don't have a government, where we are under a regime? We young people, we are ready to have that movement and ha we're ready to have that revolution, but we cannot do it alone. Revolution and movement is very different in every country. In Afghanistan, women are going on the street, but they are being killed, they're being prosecuted for their rights. Young people are being killed without any reason. This, they are, this is a revolution in Afghanistan, but is it easy? Is it easy for us to just get up and have a revolution in our country without the fear of being killed? It's not easy. Revolution and movements are different. Another of the speaker, Mr. Kailash, talked about child labor. He mentioned all the countries except Afghanistan. <laughs> Afghanistan is one of the countries where child labor has been at, in Afghanistan since 1950. In Afghanistan, right now, schools are banned for girls. It's more than a year right now. You, people don't realize the consequences of this uh, situation on regional countries, on Pakistan, on Central Asian country, on Iran. We were talking about Palestine and Israel issue in one of the panel, and the Israeli delegate got up and talked about the situation of women in Iran, but no mention of women in Afghanistan. We are the neighbor of Iran. This is how we are doing selective activism when we are talking about issues of peace, education, and when young people coming to these forms witness this, this will be ingrained in our memories as well. We need to do better. What solution is? Do not have selective activism. Why Afghanistan is such a failure right now that we're witnessing? Because we don't have a collective approach. We're having selective approaches to every country and to every context. We should move on from this and make changes in our approaches as well. And that's my last comment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just say, Hina, that your presence will make that we will not let our Afghanistan children down. Um, inspiring and insightful remarks from somebody who has wowed me and certainly the rest of this audience with her bravery. Uh, we are now going to pivot to hearing from Kai, who will be discussing his work in startups and uh, the key issues surrounding education and the development of skills in the education system. Kai? Thank you, Kevin. So before I begin, I think it's very important to acknowledge that everything I'm about to say can only be relevant after we have basic access to education. It comes from a very privileged point of view. 
So my name is Kai. I'm a 19-year-old inventor. I've been building things since I was seven, and I started building fun and dangerous things like flamethrowers and air cannons. However, eventually, I pivoted to building assistive technologies for the disabled, and now I build education technology. I've worked on a range of experimental technology, from 3D printed food, satellite enabled robot deliveries, to rem remotely operated vehicles for coastal exploration. Singapore boasts one of the highest education rankings in the world. Whether it is math, science, or engineering, our students have consistently outperformed the rest of the region. However, if you spend a bit of time in Singapore, you'll notice that kids have significantly fewer soft skills. Some of these soft skills are problem solving, creativity, and communication. When faced with adversity, they do not know how to be adaptable and solve a problem if there is no textbook answer. So why are soft skills important? Every young leader here today is a result of divergent thinking. We didn't get here because we aced our exams or with extremely good math skills. I think we're here because of two key factors. Number one, we have the skill set to make a change in our own fields, whether it is law, human rights, politics, or education. Number two, we have the courage to speak up. We carry enough to even try to make a change instead of focusing solely on our personal gains. If we're able to develop both these hard skills and soft skills within youth, I'm sure that the future generation will be well equipped to solve future hard problems. So the question is how, right? Um, everyone here probably knows Lego. As some of you know, Lego has an education arm to, to develop STEM skills through robotics. Now Lego is great, but it's simply too expensive. A robotics kit can go for up to $800 and requires a skilled trainer co to conduct the classes. With these two factors applying to almost all the STEM programs out there, 70% of the world does not have access to quality STEM education automatically. So two years ago, I started Stick'em with a very simple premise. Create a STEM kit that teaches hard skills, robotics, coding, physics, and soft skills, computational thinking, problem solving, creativity, and teamwork. We do this by using wooden chopsticks, geometric connectors, and a super simple electronics kit to build chopstick robots. We then give children different activities, challenges, and competitions related to real-world problems to open their eyes and see the problems around them. Although we have only reached 1,500 children, the model of having a low-cost STEM education kit you can easily deploy to developing regions has proven itself to be quite effective. The thing is, teachers in developing regions are often either overburdened or simply do not care enough to try new things. So these solutions have to be designed to be as self-guided as possible, with minimal reliance on the teacher. Luckily, with digital access increasing significantly in the past decade, students are now able to access learning materials on their own devices. I went my opening remarks here, and I'm looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Kai, the work that you're doing is wonderful. I think everybody is uh, happy to see that demonstration of your work on your desk. Fascinating, um, and I'm glad that the youth of today are learning skills that unfortunately uh, have fallen by the wayside in many developed countries. Uh, we now have the privilege of hearing from Kintu about a free, safe, and educated world for children. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'll just take everybody almost two decades back to tell you a story about a boy uh, who was a car cleaner in a very small town of uh, a ruler part of India and he, he was only uh, seven years old and working for more than 15, 16 hours with his father and uh, he never went to school and even he could not dream of uh, and uh, their only, uh, the family could only, uh, goal was to make uh, a meal for two times, uh, a meal for both of the time in a day so they can uh, live their life and never thought about anything else. But one day his life changed when his, he was rescued from the work, he was withdrawn from the work and brought to a place where he could dream of, where he could live his childhood, where he could be what he want to be. And that place is Bal Ashram in Rajasthan, India. And the place has changed the lives of hundreds of the children and but it was only possible because of a, of a man 
who has not only changed his own that boy life but a life of personally changed the lives of thousands of the children and his efforts has led to change the lives of millions of the children around the world and i'm glad that today he's sitting with me and listening me and i want to uh, uh, just introduce we all know him but he's my hero he's mr kalas satyarthi and if i'm today i'm speaking in front of all of you it's because of him and and it's because that i was able to get education and when you when i'm speak in english which is not even my mother tongue and i'm uh, today i'm in a different country which is not my country and not only this but i have traveled across different countries to the united nation to the european union to the vatican youth symposium or march across india it was only possible because i was able to get education and i believe that all of you who are here might believe uh, might be thinking that giving education or chance uh, to the children to get education or to the live their childhood is a kind of mercy or kindness or a charity but i want to change your thought that this is not a mercy this is not a comp this is not kindness this is their right every child in this world who is living is the responsibility is responsibility of their government or the people who are around the world is that he get his childhoods back he get his rights and this is the constitutional right which by or say uh, given by the united nation uh, uh, kids charter or say the uh, given by the constitution of their own country but we see there are still more than 160 million children who are left behind and they are every day they are exploited they are beaten up they are not able to go to school they cannot dream of so i so i want that every child around the world can uh, to get education and that's the only way that can change this world and the, all the youth and the people who are sitting there i want all you to come together that only by giving them platform or giving them giving their rights back we can make this possible that every child who are around the world can dream what he want to be and there's one another thing i want to just bring back uh, bring to all of you is that we see uh, by doing kindness or sympathy we are feeling their suffering we are feeling their uh, misery how they are going through but we want we all need to go one step forward and we need to be compassionate where we are turning our ideas or our uh, our feelings into action and there i i request all of you to please join me in this movement to make this world a compassionate world where everyone is there for each other and it's not just there for each other but we are making difference by doing our act and i would just request that if you are with me please raise your raise your hand and join me in this movement thank you thank you everyone another inspiring and moving address about um a fascinating story individual courage and the role of interdependence in lifting each other up in bringing each, uh, us out of poverty in bringing us into education and allowing for a fruitful existence not as individuals but as an interconnected community and i thank you so much for that address next we're going to be hearing from marcus about the importance of youth education and how we might contribute to improving its quality so when us i want to start by saying that people are our biggest most valuable resource we're the ones who're going to solve climate crisis who are going to maintain cultural heritage and build the world of future in school i was always taught here we don't learn to memorize certain solutions or formulas we learn to think and most essentially we we learn how to learn because once you require the once you acquire those skills they can be never taken away from you but even today in many parts of the world education is either considered a huge privilege 
or is inaccessible, when in fact it should be one of the most fundamental rights. How can we talk about freedom of speech if you don't even know what to say? How can we talk about freedom of speech if you haven't learned what choices do you have? But somehow, the issues of education are often postponed or overlooked. But education cannot wait. Children cannot wait when the economic crises are over or politics are settled. Every child should have an opportunity to become a useful member of society, no matter where they're coming from. It can never be the case that children are neglected irrespective of the country they're coming from, irrespective of the political regime that they have been born in. Why should a child be punished or neglected for the things done by their country's political leaders? War in Ukraine has been an important topic this year as well, of course. And I wanted to add an important factor. After Ukraine will have won the war, if Russia will ever change, uh, it will happen with a new generation and a new establishment of new collective mindset with a complete elimination of the legacy that President Putin is trying to leave. Uh, but of course, it's not only Russia. I can, it's Iran, Afghanistan, and any country suffering from their political regime. Children and education is where we start to bring positive changes. Because educated kids will leave to educated students. Educated students will, leave, uh, will lead to educated adults. And educated adults make educated society. And once we have educated society, we no longer have to worry about what political decisions they will make, how they're going to deal with the pandemic, or react to propaganda, etc. We have to start, and this has been repeated many times, but I want to repeat it one more time. We have to start to view education as an investment, not as an, ex not as an expense. Because investment in education can never fail. The failure comes only with insufficient education. In the past few days, I've listened to many panelists, and one of the most common um, things that the panelists usually concluded with is that this particular thing <coughs> is one of the most important things, and we must concentrate on that. But I want to say, and um, I think we can all agree, that education should be the priority. Um, the education that the next generations are getting. And by education, I mean education about climate change, about mental health, about critical thinking, any type of education. Um, but we have to be careful, because once if we make everything a priority, then nothing is a priority. Uh, and to conclude, I want to say that if we truly want to make a change, we start by educating children and making education accessible in the countries where it's needed the most. Thank you. Marcus, uh, incredible points. I just want to particularly uh, linger on what you said about viewing education not as an expense, but as an investment. Um, and I think hearing how that sentiment echoes that of a previous panel uh, shows the interconnectedness between youth, the, the lack of divergence in our goals and our collective efforts in trying to bring about a better world. This new way in which we see things finds its way in terms of uh, education, in terms of how we view the climate and sustainability, and continues this path uh, and really demands our presence in these uh, fields. Uh, we're lucky to now hear from Raphael, who is going to discuss the role of non-formal education and youth work in building an education system that meets the demands of this century. Thank you very much, Kevin. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, esteemed organizers, fellow participants. It's truly an honor to be here with you and to share my thoughts on the following topic. So how can we ensure the people around the world have access to the education and training they need to succeed in 21st century economy? And what steps can government, businesses, civil society take to promote lifelong learning and skills development? So it's not a secret uh, to anyone that there is a huge gap between technology-driven, exponentially rising um, rate of change and human historic adaptation. Advances in uh, automation and artificial intelligence are so high that they risk leaving a significant portion of humanity behind. Experts state that it's only by learning faster and uh, governing smarter we can attempt to catch up. 
having this challenge in front of us and looking for the ways to transform uh, the education system. It's very saddening to realize that we fall behind even in um, basic forms of education provided worldwide. And according to UNESCO Institute for Statistics, as for 2021, global average enrollment rate in secondary education was approximately 64%, while the enrollment rate for tertiary education was as low as 38. And yet, uh, although formal education is received by many people worldwide, it is hard to say that to what extent this education meets the needs and demands of 21st century. I highlighted the problem of access um, to education, realizing that it's a fundamental starting point, but today I would like to focus more on what we can uh, do to make this education um, an educational system more effective through non-formal education and enable an efficient lifelong learning approach. The importance of lifelong education is emphasized in SDG 4 as well, uh, which is dedicated to providing quality education and promoting continuous, continuous learning opportunities for all. Of course, um, these opportunities, they can include and not limited to working with non-governmental institutions and um, organizations, attending non-formal educational programs, and uh, as a former president and current uh, supervisory board member of European Youth Parliament Azerbaijan, uh, it is a chapter of the largest non-formal education platform in uh, Europe that now expanded to 40 countries. I could observe and analyze the impact of non-formal education not only on the capital and uh, uh, use in capital in general, but uh, on the use in disadvantaged regions as well. And uh, the impact was obviously tremendous. Um, there is also uh, many research data that uh, refers to this, but taking into account that in our time I won't go into, I would just say that uh, by the researches of UNESCO and um, World Bank, we can see that non-formal educational programs, they improve uh, literacy rates, they increase access to education, and they provide students with the practical skills and knowledge they need to directly apply uh, to their workplace. So moreover, um, non-formal education can also help bridge the gender gap in education as it often provides flexible learning options that are more accessible to uh, many girls and women worldwide. So non-formal education programs are also cost effective, that's obvious because you can use them in different setups. Uh, and being aware of these benefits, I think uh, it can lead us to the result that since the youth work not only contributes to the learning, of course, but also it encourages young people to take the responsibility for the, um, for the positive changes in the society, then the mix of this uh, youth work coupled with non-formal education, therefore extend uh, far beyond personal development and inclusion uh, in education. And youth policy in Azerbaijan, I'll cover it shortly, that is a prime example of effective use of youth work to promote non-formal education. Taking the state youth policy as a roadmap, Azerbaijani governmental institutions fund and support uh, numerous youth NGOs, allowing them to plan and implement sustainable educational programs. Um, one of the examples is uh, Youth Foundation of Republic of Azerbaijan that was established a decade ago. Uh, and uh, by many programs, use uh, and NGO are able to work with students, volunteers, vulnerable families and unprivileged youth in regions by the programs and grants that um, are provided by Youth Foundation. So uh, as a coming back to my platform as a director of Azerbaijani student and alumni platform uh, that uh, focuses on the work with uh, Azerbaijani graduates and students around the globe. We also give a huge attention to non-formal education and uh, we try to create dialogue between them and stakeholders, uh, respected stakeholders in the country that countries they study. Uh, and we are very much open for creating the uh, common programs. We are right now uh, having some exchange programs with, uh, between Azerbaijani and foreign universities. So we are looking very much forward for uh, creation, something together. I want to thank uh, everyone who took part in the creation of this forum for us to have opportunity to share, to learn from each other. And I hope that our cooperation won't uh, last just in the frame of uh, our event, but will continue further 
for the contribution of uh, to the contribution of our global community. Thank you very much. We hear next from from Rudolf, who is going to be incorporating some of his personal experiences. Uh, to illustrate the impact of social media use and mental health problems and the role that education might play in solving it, please. Thank you, Kevin. Ladies and gentlemen, you might have noticed that now I'm dressed in all black. In Latvia, this color is associated with funeral. I almost lost two of my great friends and it is a miracle that they are both alive today. One of them decided that it's so overwhelming that he's going to take rope, lock the bedroom door, take stool, attach it to his neck. He took a step. Fortunately, from the gravitation physics, the chandelier broke off the ceiling and he still is alive today. Other friend of mine was there too. He was in a bathtub with razor blades cutting his wrists. With the fear in his voice he decided that it is not the way and he wants to keep fighting. So by the last power inside him, he called his best friend, which saved his life. While talking to them, Richard and Janis, later they mentioned that Experiencing overwhelming social media pressure was one of the main reasons for their decisions. Early studies have found that the link between heavy social media use and increased risk in depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, and even suicidal thoughts. By constant comparison to others, Cyberbullying, sleep disturbance, and gratification of unrealistic beauty standards. A large proportion of our young children are on the edge or are, are already facing mental health problems. The number of lethal cases are increasing, are increasing rapidly. But what can we do to help the young people not to suffer from mental health illnesses and to help them? I agree with the panel yesterday, which was about the health, which stated that we have to take our own, we have to take everything in our own hands and take care of our bodies, which is good sleep, nutrition and exercise, but it is not enough in mo modern world of overwhelming information, social media companies trying to exploit, uh, exploit our children's minds. We need to be teaching about the importance of mental health. Good mental health practices should be in curriculum of every school in the world. We also must regulate social media use in our younger generations. Most of the children nowadays use, use social media and they are not following the guidelines of these companies. There are children who are four years old, six years old, and we are cultivating the increase of mental illnesses. Also, we need to encourage big social media companies to step up and be responsible about mental health issues. Funding and research to provide accessible health, to, to provide a, 
accessible help would be advised in order to make our society more mentally well. Social media has played an, and experimented with the minds of our children for far too long and we have to make them accountable for it. Thank you very much. Fantastic address, thank you so much. And I guess considering the role that each of us as individuals plays in limiting the social media use of ourselves, of our children, is extremely salient when talking about how to solve these issues that are truly a unique facet of this generation and of this century. I am excited to introduce our last, but most certainly not least, speaker. We'll be hearing from Lalita about the creation of a child-friendly world through education. This will be translated by Kinsu. Namaste. I am the chair of the United States 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 of the United States. I am the electorate president of 600 villages and cover six states of India and voted by the children of India. भारत में जो राष्ट्रवाल पंचायत है वह भारत के छह राज्यों में जो बच्चे स्कूल नहीं आते हैं उन्हें स्कूल से जोड़ने का काम तथा जिन बच्चों जिन लड़कियों की वह लड़कों की बाल विवाह हो जाता है उनके बाल विवाह को रोकने का काम है करता है। And we all the member of electorate general assembly we work to stop child marriages we work to bring all those children who are out of the school so that they, they can get the education and we create awareness among the people. Iske saath saath hi hai, ladke dada ladkiyo ke bedbao ke liye gaon mein ja ja kar sabhi ko samjhate hain aur jo jati gat chua chhut hai, iske liye bhi logo ko jagru karte hain. And we are also creating, we are also creating awareness through, awareness about untouchability because even uh, I have personally uh, faced it and we all the children are creating awareness about untouchability and discrimination on the basis of caste and religion in our country or in my village. बच्चे शिक्षा से इसलिए वंचित रह जाते हैं क्योंकि उन्हें बाल मजदूरी में लगा दिया जाता है और उनके साथ जातिगत भेदभाव छुआछूत की जाती है तथा उनकी बचपन में ही शादी कर दी जाती है। The children are left, left out of, did not get education and left out of from school because they are, they became victim of child marriage, they, they became child labour at the very early age of their life. जब मैं हमारे गांव की स्कूल में पढ़ती थी, तब मुझे हमारे स्कूल में छुआछूत का सामना करना पड़ा। मुझे स्कूल में जो बर्तन थे, उनको छूने नहीं दिया गया था, तब मुझे खाना नहीं बांटने दिया गया। And when I was in when I was studying in school, when and I was not allowed to touch the utensils, the which are used to where we which used to give in in food what we were eating and they and the school teachers they said that you cannot touch these utensils because you belongs to a poor caste. इस सब से मुझे बहुत बुरा लगा। And I and I feel very bad after this। मुझे लगा कि ये सब कुछ बहुत गलत हो रहा है और मैंने इसका विरोध किया। And then I realized that this is not this is not right and I'm going to fight against this। और इसके बाद में मैंने स्कूल में खाना बाँटा और अब हमारे गांव में बच्चों के साथ कोई भेदभाव नहीं होता है। And then later on I fight and I start and even myself I distributed food to the other children midday meal food in the school and stop this discrimination in my school and my village and now there is a no discrimination in my village on the basis of caste with the children. Ha 
हमारे गांव में जो लड़कियां हैं उनको स्कूल से स्कूल में नहीं भेजा जाता था उनको घर पर ही काम कराया जाता था जबकि लड़कों को एक अच्छे स्कूल में पढ़ाया जाता था और उन्हें पूरी स्वतंत्रता प्राप्त थी I see, and the children in uh, the boys in my village, they were able to go to the school, even good school. But the girls from my village, they were not even allowed to go to school. लेकिन हमारे गांव को बाल मित्र ग्राम जो हमारी श्रीमति सुमेधा केलाजी ने ये हर गांव को एक बाल मित्र ग्राम बनाया इसके बनने के बाद हमें पता चला कि ये सब कुछ बहुत गलत हो रहा है. And then when my village became a child-friendly village. Uh, which is initiative started by uh, wives of Sri, uh, Sri Kailas Sattarthi, Srimati Sumedha Kailas, and my be village became a child-friendly village, and everything changed. इसके बाद हमने घर-घर जाकर लोगों को समझाया, उन्हें लड़के और लड़की को लड़की में भेदभाव न करने के लिए बहुत जागरूक किया. And we encourage everyone not to uh, not not to create discrimination among each other on the basis of caste. मैं मेरी बात करूं तो मैं भी पहले अपने घर वालों के सामने अपनी बात रखने के लिए भी डरती थी लेकिन अब मैं यहाँ के बोल रही हूँ एंड आई वॉन्ट टू टेल अबाउट माई सेल्फ दैट इवन आई वॉज स्केयर ऑफ शेयरिंग माई फीलिंग्स माई थाट्स विथ इवन माई फैमिली पेरेंट्स बट टूडे आई एम शेयरिंग माई आइडियाज एंड माई फीलिंग्स इन फ्रंट ऑल ऑफ यू लेकिन अब हमारे गाँव में आ, और आ, उसके आसपास के क्षेत्र में लड़कियों के साथ कोई भेदभाव नहीं होता है एंड नाउ देयर इज अ नो डिस्क्रिमिनेशन विद द चिल्ड्रन इन इवन माय विलेज एंड ऑल द विलेजेस नियर टू इट और उन्हें पूरी स्वतंत्रता भी प्राप्त है एंड एवरी एवरी चाइल्ड हैज देयर ओन फ्रीडम हां सभी के अंदर करुणा होती है हम एक दूसरे को अलग नहीं समझे एक दूसरे से प्यार करें थैंक यू एंड देन एंड शी एंड शी सेइंग दैट आप everyone has compassion in inside in yourself and you have to uh, discover it ignite it and spark it and start loving each other and thank you very much a question in the front row can we get our microphone Get her, give her a microphone. I'm saying that I'm so lucky that I've spent the most of my life working with children and youth in the Arab world, but internationally as well. I started with child labor, with 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 street children, with uh, poor children. With anyway, what I want to say, first of all. I'm so angry at Nizami, board of directors. For eight years, eight years, I have been repeating times and times and times, don't have this session close to youth alone. Bring young leaders in every session that we are having in Nizami. Look today, they spoke about education, they spoke about mental health, they spoke about technology. The same topics that we have been talking about and that you said from Afghanistan courageously that it was so weird or weird that you didn't even understand what they were talking about. So I really have to say, Dr. Smail is here, enough is enough of leaving to the last day. Look, few people are here, very few people. It is a pity that they lost what they didn't hear you. This is number one. The same thing applies to women. Today we have only six women from Africa. In all the sessions, you find one woman, like when many governments, they appoint uh, two, three idiot women to be like decoration in the, in the government. So they, they follow the, the instruction with, my, with all my due respect to few women. So this is really, I think, a must that we ca I cannot repeat. I'm tired of repeating it over and over and over. And you, before you leave, you write to the board and tell them what I'm telling you because you have to be within the, the, the major sessions, the major meetings, okay? And not at the last, last session. So 
And when it comes to education, okay, we all agree that education, education, but the reality is that many children and many youth cannot have access to education for various reasons. Poverty is increasing, uh, discrimination is increasing, children in villages are sick. So, and not only that, the problem in, at least I speak about the Arab region, strategy after strategy, minister after minister, strategies, policies of education, millions of dollars are spent going into the pockets of the ministers and his deputies and I don't know what, and education is the worst. Why? Because when we have dictatorship regimes, they don't want critical thinking. They want you to go with no brain so they can control you. If you have critical thinking, you cannot be controlled. So I will conclude by saying, I'm very proud of you. I will be volunteering with you because I'm a grandmother and failed with my grandchildren to get them off this social media uh, poison. And the last thing that I want to say, with all my due respect to the young men, but I have to say to the young woman, and I keep repeating it every time I speak, you young women, the triangle of power, business, technology, and politics. Rather than that, forget it, leave it. We have been spending our years, development, human rights, free, blah, blah, blah. No, business is money, technology is power, and politics, that's how women can change, contribute to change this messy world that we left only men leading it. Thank God I'm not a man. With, with, all, with all my due respect to men, my father has been behind me and my husband. Right. I love men, I don't hate Can I finish men. up? <laughs> but I have a very short speech if you'd let me make it. Are there more questions from the audience? Yes, I know. please. I, I just want to say thank you very much. Each and every one of you have something different to say, and each and every one of you uh, have, have really highlighted the importance of your involvement in this event. I, I just wanted to tell you also that uh, this event is recorded, so therefore your views and thought are being registered, and they will be summed up as part of the procedure, as far as I believe and as far as I'm thinking. One thing you have to leave with is that don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Keep going on. Life is good. You are strong. You are the future. And we hear you. Society hear you. What you are living through now is different than what we live through ourselves. And many of you have said that about the space that you have created for yourself internationally as part of a global community. That is the future, global community. Keep it up and congratulations to each and every one of you. No more questions. Ah. to see it in its entirety. So it's not uh, just going to be summarized somewhere. All of your speeches are being recorded. There's a video camera at the back there that is recording the entire uh, session, uh, every minute of it. Thank you. I just have a, a few words to wrap up what I found to be one of the most important panels of this entire forum. Hearing you speak, I think, is one of the most important things we, could be do, we can do. And despite their age and my age, I think their insights in, uh, will play a fascinating role in the future development of our world. One of my favorite poems comes from the uh, great American bard Samuel Ullman, who once wrote that youth is not a time of life, it is a state of mind, it is a matter of the will, a temperamental predominance of courage over timidity, 
of the appetite for adventure over the love of ease. Nobody grows old merely by a number of years. We grow old by deserting our ideals. So we're joined in this audience in what I would have hoped to have been greater numbers, but nevertheless by a fantastic group of heads of state and world leaders who despite their years over us, we hope will join us in nurturing and growing that youthful invigoration and temperament that exists within all of us. It is the vital quality for social progress and unless continuously stoked through education, through learning, through conversations is something that we will all quickly lose. I often find myself thinking about the lamentation of, a, uh, of, the ancient, of an ancient Egyptian scribe reflecting on the social stagnation of his time. He writes, yesterday's state is like today's because no one is angry enough to speak out. It is the honor of a lifetime to share not just a stage, but a world with a group of uh, young people who are angry enough to speak out, who are speaking out. I think we have a right to be angry. I think we ought to be angry. And I would hope that all of you will be angry with us. Thank you. Well, I hope you see that this indeed is one of the most interesting parts of the Global Forum every year, is listening to the young people. I'm hoping for two things, and that's that all our youth leaders keep in touch with each other, network, and continue over the years to communicate and help each other, help each other rise, and help each other change their countries and the world. My second is that you remember them. You Think about them when you have opportunities for scholarships, for jobs, for speaking opportunities, for, other, for teaching assignments. If you think about these people because they really, really deserve to be the future leaders of this world. So thank you for that. Um, I just would like to say that the organizers of the event have asked me to say that the dinner has been moved to 8.30, so you have just a little more time to get dressed and ready and rest. So thank you very much for being with us, even though it was late, I think it was worth your time. <laughs>